So to begin with, um, in terms of uh, looking at politics, inequality, development, at the current time, there's, there's a real overlap in, in this. So uh, Thomas Piketty's book coming out, uh, in that he talks about the role of politics in, in determining wealth distributions. Uh, Adrian Lefwich uh, talks about the, the shape of development uh, being determined by politics in a country. Um, at the same time, we've also had recent work by, by Andy Sumner and uh, Alex Cobham uh, that talks about this, this notion of this new bottom billion, that actually most of the world's poor now uh, are living in middle-income countries. So the attention has to shift towards this notion of redistribution uh, rather than just resource, sh uh, resource shortage. We've got a situation where we have a country with uh, a space, pro space programme, um, at the same time, it's home to the uh, majority of the world's poor. So this is a type of kind of inequality we're talking about. The, the kind of overlap of development, inequality, politics uh, is very clear. At the moment, what we have is a situation, so we're, we're talking about kind of bringing politics back in, but uh, clearly politics is a very broad field, and uh, politics has to a certain extent been brought back in, and, and the politics that has been brought back in at the moment tends to focus on explaining why we get this situation. So we have very good explanations for why you have a country like India where, where we have uh, a government that's spending money on space programs, uh, equally uh, a lot of uh, issues with regard to, to poverty. So uh, a recent book by Amartya Sen and uh, Jean Drez uh, talks exactly about this issue. So AC Moglu and uh, Robinson, the, the title is, is really important here. So it's, it's why nations fail. Uh, and we're starting to get very good, we, we have very good explanations of why nations fail, uh, why we don't see change. So. Uh, a real limit with the, the kind of institutional approach, uh, which is very much seen as part of bringing this politics back in. Uh, while, uh, again, it, it's offered lots of great explanations for why we see these differences, uh, what it fails to uh, tell us is how, how change occurs uh, effectively. So heavy focus on kind of stability, institutional stability, this kind of uh, long-term inequalities, these differences shaped by the rules of the game. But when it comes to explaining change, uh, the emphasis then suddenly shifts to this notion of critical junctures, uh, which is a very different type of critical juncture to, to what Shan was talking about. It's, it's really this exogenous shock. Um, how do we get from one situation to another? It's clearly something from outside the system that's got to uh, uh, affect this. Uh, so as Merrily Grindle has, has, has described with this institutional uh, approach, it's, uh, there's a tendency to overdetermine failure uh, and underexplain um, change. Uh, a big starting point which some of the kind of very dominant political approaches think about is uh, this notion of interest uh, incentives. It's, it's incredibly useful to think about interest and incentives, uh, but actually that's not where we're going to find change happens. Uh, where change happens is actually people working against their interests, that uh, people are complex, uh, people in other countries, in developing countries, elites, uh, often do want to bring about change. Uh, the issue isn't that their interests mean that they just want to accumulate wealth, it's that it's very difficult to bring about this change. So uh, one of the things that comes out of this, these, these books uh, and a number of others uh, like them is uh, we... It's, it's political, it's finding these people that actually do have the commitment, and it's these coalitions of commitment. So we see, uh, Shan's already kind of uh, talked about this, leaders and, and coalitions, but uh, very much insider and outsider uh, leaders and coalitions. So uh, Mary Lou Grindle's book on education reform in Latin America, what you see is inside government, you see a lot of kind of strong reform uh, tendencies, but equally the, the, the ability to then bring uh, people who have worked on education for years and years into government, uh, even if it's temporarily, to, to be advisors. Uh, so you have this real mix of the types of coalitions you're bringing in, this social movements, it's, it's people that have developed an expertise, it's teachers uh, being brought into the, these circles. The politics of contention, uh, again, it's been spoken about in the case of Brazil, it's how you deal with that contention. Uh, there is clearly going to be opposition, there's clearly going to be support. And uh, one of the really interesting things is how that support and how that opposition is used and how... how so uh, another book uh, by uh, William Asher, which uh, I'd never previously come across until it was cited in one of these, uh, from the 80s, and it talks about uh, scheming for the poor. And it's effectively often this politics of contestation uh, is best dealt with through not having this very confrontational approach. It's by being able to manoeuvre, it's by being able to build support, uh, equally to, to distract opposition, to kind of uh, put opposition at ease, rather than making it a very confrontational type of politics. Uh, so one of the examples in the Against the Odds book is uh, a chief minister in India, um, the chief minister of Madhya Pradesh, um, uh, Digvijay Singh, and lots of poverty reduction strategies, lots of policies implemented. Uh, at no point during his speeches did he ever use the word poverty. 
Uh, why? Uh, because in India, there's, there's a long history of, of populist kind of politics uh, really framed around this notion of poverty, so going back to Indira Gandhi. Uh, so instead, he focused on this notion of development. Uh, dare I say it, we're, we're all in this together. Um, and, and this was what really pushed through this, this agenda, and, and, and it kind of resisted, um, avoided that opposition.